Okay, so let's get started. So I see an extra comment from James, James Hung. James says, hi everyone, James Hung here from Malaysia. Hey James, how are you doing? And uh, yes, Gregor, <laughs> Gergo Lingiel, sorry, Gergo Lingiel, hi. So you said hi in the comments, hi back at you. Okay, let's get started. So um, in this webinar, I'm gonna show you some cool stuff that you can do with C-sharp. But um, let me do a quick intro. Um, so my name is Mark Farager. Um, I have a 20 year uh, long experience in, with the .NET framework. So I became a software developer in 1995, 1995. And uh, I started out with Visual Basic 6 and COM objects. Uh, so basically the Microsoft ecosystem, but this was all before .NET, the pre-.NET era. Um, and then in 2001, uh, Microsoft basically introduced C Sharp and .NET on the world, uh, into the world. And well, I was programming in VB6 and I saw C Sharp and I was like, oh my God, you know, this is the future. I am totally gonna drop everything and I'm completely focus on .NET on C Sharp. And I've been doing that ever since. So we're in 2019 now, which means I've got 18 years of experience with the .NET framework. Um, and recently I started, um, I started switching to machine learning. So that's, um, it's, it's about a year ago, a year, a year and a half. Uh, um, I noticed that machine learning got started getting really uh, popular and I decided to specialize in machine learning, but I did not disavow my past. So what I do is machine learning in C sharp. And that's kind of weird because uh, machine learning, you know, deep learning, AI, machine learning, computer vision, um, it's all Python. All the action is in Python right now. Uh, what I try to do is do the same stuff that the Python people are doing in C Sharp. It's quite a challenge because uh, we, we don't have uh, really good libraries yet. Uh, we don't have all the features yet that people in Python are using. So it's a bit of a challenge, but things are improving every week. It's getting better and better. And this is like a brand spanking new market. Huh? Uh, machine learning in .NET is, is completely new. Um, so uh, it's, it's very exciting to be in this field. But let me quickly show you a few highlights of my career. Um, in 2001, I built um, the first video phone with true eye contact. So this was uh, kind of like a video phone with a, a, a mirror at a 45 degree angle and a camera behind the mirror. And the mirror was semi-transparent. So you could basically, you looked into the mirror and it, it showed you a reflected view of a video chat. But we put the camera behind the mirror and it was exactly where your eyes would be when you look into, uh, look into a camera. So you would look directly into a camera and at the other end, the, um, your conversation partner would see a picture of you looking directly in their eyes. So we actually calibrated the, the eye liner, the eye contact. Um, so it was really cool. You had, you had non-verbal communication uh, with this video phone. So this, this was this insane research prototype that I built for a company in 2001. Another fun fact, in 2004, uh, my business partner and I uh, built YouTube. We had a working YouTube, I kid you not. So you could record videos on your phone and then they would go into the clouds and you could present them and share them with your friends and you know, so social media sharing with video. We had a fully functioning prototype and we tried to sell it to mobile phone companies. So we went to, to O2, we went to Vodafone, we went to Orange, we went pretty much to all the, all the major phone uh, companies. And we pitched our product and nobody wanted it. Nobody believed in it. They said, you know, um, no one's gonna pay for this. So uh, in the end, we just gave up. It was like, okay, this isn't gonna work. And one year later in 2005, YouTube arrived. So we actually, we, my business partner and I, we had a YouTube before there was a YouTube. So that was pretty cool. Um, I founded two startups in the, in the Netherlands. So I founded a startup in 2001 and another one in 2008. Um, and this teaching stuff that I do now online is my third startup. So I've got an online teaching academy on the internet and that's my third startup. So I'm a serial entrepreneur and I used to fly a paraglider. So that picture that you see right now, uh, that's me. So I'm flying in Switzerland, I'm going down a hill basically. My brother was flying next to me and he had a camera and he basically just took a picture of me like that. So uh, yeah, that's my past. Um, Here's, so here's what we're gonna talk about in this webinar. Um, we're gonna talk about the driver alertness challenge. 
So the challenge here is that when you're in a self-driving car, um, the, the automation of self-driving cars isn't good enough yet. So if you're in a self-driving car and you put the car in autopilot mode and then you grab a book, you know, and you start reading or uh, you, you get a DVD player and you start watching a movie, then sometimes the car has a tendency to crash because the self-driving car software is not that good yet. It's getting really good, but we're not yet at the point where you can trust your life to a self-driving car. So all these cars have features that require that you stay alert. You have to look to the road. You have to be alert. Um, you have to be focused at all times. So Tesla has this feature where you have to grip the steering wheel. So they have sensors in the steering wheel and you have to hold your hands on the steering wheel. And as soon as you let go of the steering wheel, that works for five seconds. And then the car is basically like, okay, it's obvious that you're not, your attention isn't on the road. So, you know, um, I'm going to disengage autopilot. And then you have to grab the wheel again to keep the car in autopilot mode. So Chrysler has its own system. Now, not many people know this, but the Chrysler system is better than the Tesla system. Chrysler uses an autopilot system that they leased from a company in uh, in uh, Israel. And the Israelis are like the world leaders in self-driving car tech. So the, the Chrysler system is called Super Cruise. And it, it's even better. In Super Cruise uh, mode, in the Chrysler, there's a little camera um, you can actually see the camera if you look at this. Uh, if you look at the screen right now, at the bottom you see the steering wheel, and if you look closely at the bottom, you can see a little little bump, a little thingy. It's it's a very it's it's black on black, but you can see a very thin outline. What you're looking at is the camera. So it's a camera that is filming the driver. It's filming directly the face of the driver, and those red lights on the steering wheel, those are infrared lights, and they illuminate the face of the driver. So this Chrysler system is constantly looking at the driver's face and they're doing a basic alertness check. So they're checking if the driver is looking forward, facing forward, and if his or her eyes are open. So if you're driving in the Chrysler and it's like, oh, I spilled my Coke, let me just get it, you know, then, you know, your face moves out of the frame and then the, 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 the autopilot system will know, okay, this is bad, you know, and it will sound an alarm and it will say, okay, I'm switching off autopilot because this isn't good what you're doing right now. Um, so this is a driver alertness check. And this, of course, it involves head tracking, live head tracking. So if I'm driving, you know, and I'm like, Hey, you know, then of course I'm looking 90 degrees off. So then head tracking could detect that and would know, okay, you're no longer looking straight ahead. Um, but we also need to do eye tracking. So when you're driving and you're doing this, then again, it would be nice if the uh, alertness system no longer detects my eyes. And, you know, the, the system is basically saying, okay, you're falling asleep or you're fooling around or you're doing something weird, but this isn't good. So autopilot off. If you're driving and you're super tired and you're basically dozing off, then um, you can really detect this because um, when, when we get tired, our blink frequency, you know, they, we blink more often per, per minute and basically uh, our eyes are less, less wide open. I mean, when you're alert, your eyes are open and when you get really tired, you know, it gets smaller and smaller and there's less and less eye surface basically visible on your face. So we can train software, we can build software to detect that in real time. And I'll show you the code. It's, it's easier than you think. So I'll show you in this webinar, I'll show you how to build real-time driver alertness in C Sharp in as minimal, as, as little code as possible. So to do that, um, what we need to do is um, we need to detect a face. So um, we need to... Uh, Give me one sec. I, um, this happens sometimes on my phone. The, uh, I had the Facebook Live running, but I lost it. Uh, so I need to quickly reconnect, which is easy enough. So here's my page. For some reason, my phone tends to disconnect from Facebook. And uh, hmm. Okay, so for some reason, my phone is really messing around right now. Let me just quit the Facebook app and reopen it. So I'm going to quickly uh, reconnect because if any of one of you are posting questions on, um, 
if any of you are posting questions on the Facebook Live, I won't be able to see them, and that's a bit of a shame. So I'm back. Here we go. Yep, I'm back. Awesome. Okay, so I can see the Facebook Live again. So post your questions if you have them. I can see them again. Okay, so back to the content. Um, to do head tracking, to do live head tracking and live eye state tracking, all we need to do is um, we need to hook up a camera to a computer. So we can use a laptop and a webcam. Um, and then the, we need to write software that analyzes a face. So we need to detect a face. So, uh, you know, there's a camera frame and we need, to know, we need to detect where's the face in the frame. But then once we have the face, we need to detect aspects about the face, you know, like where are the eyebrows? Where's the nose? Where's the mouth? We need to really tell the, the software um, where the individual parts of, the, of our face are, you know, in, in X and Y coordinates. So this is, there's a standard for this. So these are called landmark points. So landmark points are known locations on a face. Um, and there are different sets of landmark points that you can use. In, um, in this app, I'm going to use a set of 68 landmark points, and I plotted them here on this slide. So what you're looking at is um, the, the 68 points that we're going to use, and you can see they're distributed all over the face. And um, each point uh, is on a known location on our face. So for example, landmark point 17 is on the left eyebrow. So for me, that would be here. So it's the tip of my left eyebrow. Um, landmark point 27 is the tip of my nose. So it's right here. So the cool thing is um, when we can train software to detect landmark points, we can project them on a, on a human face and we can do that in real time. So when I would move my head through the frame like this, the computer would follow me, follow my face and follow these landmark points. And once we have these points in real time, we can do all the other stuff. We can do head tracking, because when I turn my head, the points would rotate, and I can, I can write software that can map that rotation into 3D and uh, convert it into 3D angles. And I can detect landmark points around my eye. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of landmark points that follow the contour of my left and right eye. So um, what I could do, for example, is um, basically treat those landmark points as a bounded surface, and then just calculate the surface area. And then if there's a lot of surface area, then my eyes are wide open like that. And if there is almost no surface area, then my eyes are closed. And obviously I'm falling asleep behind the wheel. Um, so once we have the landmark points, we can do all this cool stuff. So I'll show you an, an old prototype that I built. Um, so this, uh, so this is not a self-driving car. This is a, a different thing, uh, a different app that I built a year ago. The idea was that um, I built a smart television. So it's a television that's playing a movie. Uh, so imagine you're watching a movie, like your favorite movie, like Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, you're watching it and you're thinking, "Oh my God, what's happening now?" And then the doorbell rings because the pizza delivery guy is, you know, with your pizza. So the annoying thing is you have to go to the, you know, you have to get your pizza. And, you know, as you walk away, you, you miss this whole part of the movie. So you have to rewind. Um, I mean, I hope you're not watching it live. Uh, you know, if you're streaming it from Netflix, you have to rewind and watch that part again. So it's annoying. So wouldn't it be great if we had a TV that automatically pauses if we look away? So this app basically simulates that. So you can see it's a picture of a TV and it's tracking my, my head in real time. And then when I, when I look away from the TV screen, the TV will automatically pause. So um, this is a video, so it's, it's, I, I actually built this up, uh, but I recorded it, so let me just play it for you. Uh, so check this out. So you can see I'm looking, see I'm looking from left to right, so you can see my, my head moving in the bottom right. You can see the, the landmark points on my face, see, so it's tracking the, the corners of my eye, the corners of my mouth, uh, my nose and my chin. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, six landmark points. And as I'm moving my head, you can see the sliders moving. So it's, it's tracking the head angle, the X, Y, and Z head angle in, uh, in real time. And as soon as I'm no longer looking straight ahead, um, you can see this paused uh, label appear on the television. So this would be a really cool app where, you know, you're watching your favorite movie and then someone asks you a question, you know, on the other side of the room and you turn your head and you, you start answering the question like this and the TV helpfully pauses, you know, and once your attention is back on the TV, the TV resumes with your favorite movie. So 
I think that will be very cool. So it's fairly easy to do. So you can see this is a simple C-sharp application. It's like two, 300 lines of C-sharp code, and it does the real-time uh, head tracking. It does the head tracking in real time. So uh, once, you know, once I'm able to, to um, detect these landmark points on my face in real time, I can use the coordinates of these points to calculate the angles. Now to do that, to go from landmark points to angles, it's fairly complicated. But I'll show you a um, kind of a rough summary of how it's done. So the idea is what we do is uh, we pick these five landmark points. So it works with five. You can do more, but five is basically enough for accurate tracking. So we take, uh, you can see it's actually numbered points. Eh? It's 8, 36, 45, 8, 30, 36, 45, 48, and 54. So six landmark points. Um, and we, we also model them in 3D. So we take a three-dimensional head model and we, we use an arbitrary coordinate system of X, Y, and Z. And we, um, we basically locate these points in three dimensions. So now there's basically two different views of these landmark points. So on the one hand, we have the points detected in the camera, on the camera frame. So we have a two dimensional camera frame with a face with those six points. And for each point, we have an X and a Y coordinate. And that's like two coordinates, so it's two dimensional. But we also have this three-dimensional model of the face with the landmark points in X, Y, and Z coordinates. So it's basically the same thing we're looking at, but now it's in 3D. So the cool thing is the 2D and 3D, they're related. You know, the 3D model gets, basically it gets projected into a two-dimensional plane. You know, um, it, there's, there's some kind of projection that goes from 3D to 2D, and there's math available to um, actually calculate that transformation, that projection from scratch. So this is basically how the math works in the software. Um, it takes the 2D landmark point coordinates that we take from the camera frame, it takes a 3D landmark point model, and then it just does a lot of math to find the, the relationship between those two, uh, those two views, those two landmark point views. And in the end, we get, these, uh, we get a translation matrix and a rotation matrix, and we can combine this into three head rotation angles. So it's a lot of source code. It's complicated math. I won't bore you with the details, but it's all in the source code. So if you want to take a look, you can just download the source code of my app and, uh, and, and look at it. I put everything in a separate class. So you can basically just look at the math. And if you have a background in mathematics, then it's, it's cool stuff to look at. It's, uh, it's not super complicated, but it would take me forever to explain. So um, we can actually uh, estimate head rotation uh, just by looking at how these six landmark points move from left to right. So if I go back to my uh, video right here, find the play button, which is here. So you can see uh, in the bottom right, you see my face, I'm rotating my head left to right, and you can see how these green points move along the frame. So what the software is doing is it's constantly calculating the X and Y coordinates of these uh, six landmark points and then running them through a bunch of math to, um, uh, to calculate the um, head rotation angles. So it's pretty cool, right? So um, if you think this is pretty cool, uh, let me know in the chat. So what do you think so far? Put something in the chat, the Zoom chat or the Facebook Live. Is this cool so far or not? What do you think? <laughs> Drago says, it's cool. Nice. Glad you agree. Anyone else? Did you know that you can do this in C Sharp? The, um, uh, like, are you aware that you can do real-time head tracking with C Sharp? Like, did you know that's possible? So John Thompson says it's Arctic cool. <laughs> You're staying in the polar vortex theme here. I like that. Okay, so uh, Dragos, nope, you didn't know it's Brian. Don't sell it to teachers, professors to track students. Hey, dude, awesome idea. In fact, I'm not gonna use that idea. I'm not gonna touch it, it's all yours. So feel free to launch a startup around that, uh, that topic. Create this little black box that a professor can put at the front of an auditorium and it films all the students and attracts their attention in real time. You will be a millionaire and you'll be hated by all the students in the world. 
Um, so Dragos, you, you're saying it depends if you have the libraries. Awesome observation. I'll get back to that. But that's a very good point. So I'm looking at the Facebook Live. Uh, Venkatesh says it's awesome. True. Um, Eugene, Eugene says it's cool. Um, Alan says yes, pretty awesome. I didn't imagine this is possible. Siva says nice. So cool stuff. Huh? So okay, let's move on to the next bit. So uh, for the next bit, what we're going to do is eye tracking, eye stage tracking. So eye stage tracking is very simple. It's just you know track if eyes are open or closed. And um, people often use this for um, like blink detection, um, for um, uh, alertness detection, like is someone awake or asleep. Yeah, I think there are actually apps. There are actual apps that you can install in your car that uh, track your, your eyes and they will alert you if you are falling asleep. So you can basically, you, I think uh, they run on your phone. So you put your phone in your car, it films your face. And then if you're driving and you're starting to doze off, uh, you know, the, the phone will buzz and it will wake you up again. Uh, so you, you can actually get these as apps. So this is actually a, quite a popular concept. Um, let me show you the video. So I've got a, this is again a prototype app. The idea here was that um, you create a, an app that takes your picture. So you can see this is a big button there eh, in the bottom left, take picture. So it will take my picture. Um, and um, the idea is that don't you hate it when someone takes your picture and your eyes are closed? So like they take your picture and you end up looking like, like that, you know? It's like really bad. And then you have to take the picture over and over and over again. Imagine if there's a whole crowd, there's 10 people in the room, you make this crowd selfie, you know? There's always one person in the crowd with their, their, their eyes closed or their mouth looking weird, you know? And then you have to make like three or four of, of pictures and then pick the best one, you know? It's, it sucks. So why not create a camera that does face detection on everyone, then it does eye state detection, and it refuses to take the picture until everybody's eyes are open. So everybody has to look alert, basically. So that's this app. This app tracks my eyes in real time. And that take picture button constantly disables or enables. So it basically just disables if my eyes are closed, so I can't take a picture. So I can only take pictures uh, um, if, I, if I actually look cool in the photo. So let me play that for you. There we go. So you, you can see my eyes are being tracked at the bottom right. See, that's the eye state detection. And you've got the slider left that's, that's moving. It's moving left to right. And it's, um, it, it's, so it's, it's basically tracking my eyes. So you can see I'm, I'm bulging my eyes open right now. Um, then go, now going back to normal. So I'm moving closer to the camera and it's, 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 uh, it uses a normalized eye surface. So it still works when I move closer. So that's cool. So, you know, it's, it's pretty good. It's, it's a bit, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of noise. You can see the slider kind of wobbling, but um, it's, it, it is tracking my eyes. It needs a lot of light. I, um, I, did, I filmed this in a co-working cafe. And there wasn't enough light for accurate tracking. Um, but you can see it's, it's working quite decently. You know, it's when I basically just look in the camera, um, it's, um, it's looking, it's basically tracking my eyes as being open normally. So we can use this code to track eye state in real time and we can add this to our self-driving car app. So um, we have to be looking forward, straight up the road, and our eyes have to be open, otherwise the car will refuse to self-drive. Um, let me quickly look at the um, Facebook Live comments. So Eugene, you posted it in the Facebook Live. Um, you mentioned the source code, so will it, be, will it be available to us? Yes. So all the source code I'm using for this exercise, I will share freely with you. So um, afterwards, I, I still have to create a zip file of the code. Um, so I, I can't shake, uh, share the link with you yet. But if you, um, if you want the source code, just send me an email and um, I'll reply with the source code link so you can download it. Uh, you can download the zip file and use it. So I'm literally gonna share the code and I'm gonna show it to you in a few minutes. Eugene, question, will it work in very low lighting conditions? No, it will not. And that is why when we look at the Chrysler self-driving car, it has these infrared LEDs on the steering wheel. 
they are constantly illuminating the face of the driver so that the camera has enough light to work with. So you need good lighting conditions. So I've got a, a lamp above me right now. Uh, there's a light above me. So there's enough light now to show you this demo. You need good lighting conditions. So here's how I did it. There's different ways of tracking eye states, but this was, this is my algorithm. Um, so what I did is I, I basically, I calculated, um, I, I took the landmark points around my eye. So this is my left eye. And um, you can see these, these landmark points, they form a contour around my eye. So what I can do is um, I can basically connect um, the surface. I can take these green landmark points and draw this blue line around it. And then I can basically just take that surface. So that gives me the number of pixels, you know, in, in this eye area of my left eye. Um, and then I can extrapolate how big my full eyeball would be. I mean, uh, landmark points uh, 36 and 39 are on the left and the right edge of my eye. So if I just draw a circle through those two points and calculate the surface area of that surface, I get the whole surface of my entire eyeball, right? So um, that blue area is the visible area of my eye and the red circle is the total area of my eyeball. So I just divide those two. So it's really cool because that gives me a fraction, that gives me a number that tells me the fraction of the surface area of my eye that is visible to the camera. So this will be a number between zero and one. Now, unfortunately, it's impossible to fully open. I can't open my eye completely, that the entire eyeball is visible, you know, that, that doesn't work that way. So I need some kind of um, um, compensation factor. I need a compensation factor that basically says, even with my eyes fully open, like bulging open like that, I still only see so much percentage of my full eyeball. So I, I had to basically guess that number. So I, I estimated it at 40%. So that's the 0 0.4 that you see in this formula. Um, that basically says that even with my eye fully open, only 0.4% is visible. So if I add that factor in, I get a number between zero and one, where zero is my eyes are closed and one is my eyes are fully open. And I can do this math on the, um, on the eye landmark points in real time. I can do it like multiple times per second. So that gives me the state of both my eyes independently, left and right eye, a number between zero and one, where zero is eyes fully closed and one is eyes fully open. Um, so it's super simple, basically. It's much easier than the head uh, angle tracking. Um, so if I combine those two, here's what you get. So this is the app. I'll show you the app live in a second, but this is, this is a recording, so you can see what happens when, uh, when it's running. So I've got this picture of a Chrysler self-driving car, so it's actually in super cruise mode right now. You can see there's a little green steering wheel on the dashboard. That means it's in super cruise mode. And you've got this green bar at the top in the, embedded in the steering wheel. Uh, so that means the car is driving itself. And um, to keep it in self-driving mode, the only thing you need to do is have your hands on the wheel, look straight ahead with your eyes open. So here I'm just simulating the, the Chrysler software in a Windows application. So it looks like this. So in the top right corner, you can see a live camera feed. And then at the bottom, you can see the uh, head pose detection. There's a little line sticking out of my nose that is tracking my head angle. And um, you can see my eye state. So you can see basically this white surface area of my eyes, um, which, you know, they get bigger, they get smaller. So the, the, the software can track my eye state and my head pose in real time. And I've got this, this label that appears. So when the software is no longer confident that my attention is on the road, um, it will show this label. It will say, warning, autopilot will disengage. So the idea is that, um, you know, as soon as the car detects that my attention is not on the road, this label would appear, and then maybe five seconds later, the autopilot system could shut down. And I think in the Chrysler, in, if you're in super cruise mode, the, the green bar at the top, it will actually turn, I think it turns orange or it turns red, it changes color to indicate that the car is no longer trusting your, your level of attention, basically. So here I'm simulating that with a label. But I mean, this is literally the software in the Chrysler. I mean, they, they're not using C Sharp, obviously, but um, it, it's the same principle and I'm sure it's the same reliability level. 
I mean, the, I'm using a commercial class computer vision library for this code. Uh, so um, you could easily put this in a car. Um, okay, let me check the um, let me check the comments. So Eugene, in the Facebook Live, you're saying, I guess down the road you'll need an initial scan of the eyes before one has to implement the program just to get an initial value of the actual users. Is that a fair assumption? Well, you don't have to do that because you you the camera is in the car. Um, you're sitting in the car seat. The camera is on the steering wheel. So the designers of the Chrysler know exactly how far away the eyes are from the camera. Because, I mean, the, the, the seat has a certain shape. I mean, you could put sensors in the car seat so that if you lean back, you know, if you, if you change the angle of the seat, um, the software would actually know the angle. So it can constantly calculate how far away the eyes are. So you can pre-calibrate the entire system. Um, so in my software, I have to, I have to calibrate with these, these fudge numbers, you know, like the 40%. But in the Chrysler, you have all the data. You've got a calibrated camera, and you know exactly how far, how far away the eyes are. And of course, different people have different sizes of heads, but the, the, uh, the differences will be tiny between people. Um, I mean, their eyes will be, I mean, it will be on the order of centimeters, you know? Their eyes will be in different locations, but it will just be a few centimeters up or down or left or right. So you can easily pre-calibrate this in software. And I'm sure that's what they did at Chrysler. They, uh, they pre-calibrated the camera and they added knowledge into the software of exactly how far the driver's head would be from the camera. All right, let's take a look at some code. Who wants to look at some code? Put in the chat if you would like to see the code. I'm just forcing you guys to be more interactive here. If you don't want to see some code, just tell me. Yeah? Yeah, I can stop right here. <laughs> All right. So, do you guys want to see the code? Okay, now keep in mind, keep in mind. Um, so my core business is machine learning and computer vision, right? So I'm, I'm programming in C-sharp, but I build computer vision and machine learning solutions, which is awesome. I do not have super powered hardware. So <laughs> John Thompson says, let me see the Visual Basic 6 version. Yeah, with COM objects, you know, with DCOM. Okay, let's not do that. Um, so you might think that I've got like a, a server rack here, you know, outside of the view of this camera and uh, like, like a, a hugely overpowered laptop with 16 GPUs chained on a, a firewire connection or something weird like that. Actually, no. So my work computer is a MacBook Pro uh, from 2015. So it's this, this laptop right now that I'm using. So it's a MacBook Pro and it uses an Intel Iris GPU. Now, what you need to know about an Intel Iris GPU is that you cannot use it for machine learning. Uh, you cannot use it for computer vision because only NVIDIA GPUs work for machine learning. So um, I've got the worst possible hardware you can imagine to do this kind of stuff. And Nevertheless, my software is still working and working quite decently. So I'm basically I'm at the lower end of the scale in terms of hardware, um, but um, I, I can still build these apps and they actually work in real time. So that just proves to you that you don't need a super overpowered computer to do this kind of stuff. You can run this stuff on old computers, no problem. You need a good camera. You definitely need a good camera for this, but you can use a laptop that's like four or six or seven years old and it will work. So it actually gets worse. This is a Mac, right? I told you I was going to make a Windows application. So how am I doing that? I can't use Bootcamp because then I would have to reboot into the Windows operating system and then I couldn't continue talking to you because this is Zoom on the Mac. So I'm using a virtual machine. I'm using Windows 10 in a virtual machine on a four-year-old MacBook Pro from 2015. Uh, so again, this is the worst possible scenario you can imagine. No one in their right mind would uh, run machine learning and computer vision applications in a virtualized environment, yet I do it. Why? Because this is a baseline in terms of performance. If I can get decent performance on this configuration, then um, the, my, my software, my code will run perfectly in a normal scenario where uh, Windows is running on bare metal and the computer is more recent. 
So I, I, I kind of like developing on these baseline environments where, you know, uh, I really have to work hard to get decent performance out of my system. So um, let me move to Visual Studio. So can you guys see this? You should be seeing Visual Studio 2017 right now. Let me know in the chat if you can see it. I actually can't see the chat, so I have to quickly go back to my other view. Okay, yep, Drago, so you can see it, awesome. Okay, so this is, uh, <laughs> that's a good start. Uh, let me close these things. So, so this is uh, Windows 10 uh, running in a virtual machine um, on my Mac. And I'm using the community edition of uh, Visual Studio. So this is the free version of Visual Studio. So you don't have to pay for anything if you want to replicate this. So here's my code. Now, um, I think, who was it? I think Dragos, you asked me a question about libraries. Uh, yeah, so Dragos, he said, it depends if you have the libraries. Uh, in terms of computer vision, and you are absolutely correct. Um, to, to use computer vision on a Windows application, in a Windows application, in C Sharp, um, the best route you can follow is to use commercial grade computer vision libraries. And the best library right now that's out there is called DLib. So DLib is just awesome. It's really good at um, computer vision tasks, you know, um, uh, parsing live camera streams, doing object detection, motion detection, doing face detection, face landmark detection. That's all pretty awesome. But unfortunately, the library is written in C++. So um, it's not C Sharp. So to get it to work in C Sharp, we need to use a wrapper. So I'm using a library called dlib.net. dlib.net, you can actually see it here in, uh, see, right here in the solution browser. So dlib.net.native.dll is the C++ DLL. So this is just compiled in C++ and it's, it's a single DLL, so it's nice. So you just drop one extra file into your bin folder and then everything will work. Um, um, but of course we need a wrapper to be able to, um, to work with this library. So that's from C-sharp, we, we can actually call into this library. So dlib.net has this neat little assembly here, dlib.net.dll. So this is a C-sharp wrapper library. So it's, it's just a, a public interface, lots and lots of methods. And then the implementation of every method is just an external call that goes into the C++ library. So it's a very thin wrapper around C++ to expose the functionality to C Sharp. I think there's also a Dlib Sharp uh, NuGet package that you can use. So different teams on GitHub have wrapped Dlib, Dlib in uh, a C Sharp wrapper. Um, I just use this one, dlib.net, because I kind of like it. But you, you can use another one. So dlib.net, I didn't even write it myself. It's a NuGet package. You just pull in the NuGet package, you install it, and bam, it works. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so I'm using dlib.net to uh, do face detection and landmark detection. So here's my app. So it's a WPF uh, application. Um, so you can see it's fairly simple. It's, um, it's, um, it's, it's basically, let me open the properties panel so you can see what, uh, what kind of controls I'm using. Um, but it's, it's basically, I mean, this is just a big picture box um, that shows the um, Super Cruise system from uh, Chrysler. Uh, this is a picture box. Uh, this is a picture box. And this is a label, obviously. And th this is the only special control. It's a video source player from the Accord library. So this thing is a, basically a video player. So I can, I can hook this up to my webcam and it will just start playing the live webcam stream. And then I have this neat event handler where I can pull frames out of that live stream. So I get bitmaps for, you know, for every point in time of the camera live stream. And then I can work on, that fr on those frames. So let me show you the code. So I'm going into main form. Um, so there's two um, classes you need for this. You're gonna need something called a frontal face detector. So this thing is defined, it's declared in DLib. So this is a detector that will detect faces. So no details about faces. It will just detect rectangles, rectangular areas where the faces are. So if I show DLib a picture with 10 people in it, it will detect 10 faces. 
So it's called a frontal face detector. The next thing we need is this thing. It's called a shape predictor. And for every detected face, it will find the landmark points. So the shape predictor finds the landmark points. That's it. With these two classes, we can, we can do the live landmark detection. So I can show you how that works. So here, this uh, message right here, see it's called detect landmarks, detect landmarks. So you can see it's, the message is receiving a bitmap, which is the current camera frame. Um, and it's going to do landmark detection on this frame. So the only thing I need to do for landmark detection is, first of all, I have to convert the image, uh, the bitmap, into something that Dlib can work with. So Dlib works with... Um, um, Dlib uh, images are basically just arrays, arrays of um, uh, bytes, basically. So to create uh, this, this, this Dlib image, I need to use this conversion function. So I just say image dot two array two D, and uh, I, I it's a generic method. So I provide this RGB pixel structure, and it basically just converts the bitmap into uh, a data structure that Dlib can understand. But this is still the image, right? It's just a, an image stored in a different way. And then I run this bit of code right here. So I'm using the face detector, and I call the detect method. I'm providing the Dlib image. And what I get back is a, see it's an array of rectangles. So this is very simple. It just says, okay, here are the faces. So it gives me an array of rectangles. Here are all the faces. Then the next step is that I use the shape predictor. And I again use the detect method. I provide the image and I provide one of the rectangles. It can be any one of the rectangles. So you can see here, up here, line 71, I, I just grabbed the first face in the image because in a car with this camera on the steering wheel, there's only gonna be one person. I mean, you, you can't have two or three people sitting on the driver's seat in a car, you know, that's not gonna happen. So there's one face, I just grab the first face. And then with the shape predictor, I run the shape predictor on this, this face, or so I run it on the image, I provide the rectangle of that detected face, and it will return um, something called a, um, well, you can actually see it uh, up here. It returns something, an object called full object detection. It's kind of weird, but it's a, a class that encapsulates the 68 landmark points. So this is it. This is live facial landmark detection in C sharp. And you can see it's unbelievable. It's just like three or four lines of code. The only um, somewhat convolu uh, convoluted part of this so source code is that I've got this bit here that I, I run the face detection once, and then for the next five camera frames, I only do the landmark detection. So um, I, I run the landmark detection on every single camera frame, but I only do the face detection once every five frames. And the reason for that is that face detection is slow. Face detection is, is, is quite slow. It takes between 20 and 100 milliseconds. So it's, it's a fairly slow algorithm. Whereas landmark detection is ultra fast. Landmark detection runs in one millisecond. So the overhead is just minuscule. Um, so uh, for performance reasons, I, I don't run my face detection all the time. So it's a bit risky. I mean, if, my, if I move my head really quickly like that, then the... Um, the, um, the code is going to struggle to keep tracking my face because it's not doing the face detection in every frame. So I'm, I'm assuming that the driver of a self-driving car is not going to make very rapid head movements. He's not going to move, he's not going to, he or she is not going to move his or her head faster than, um, you know, that it, it would completely lose track uh, from one camera frame to the next. So I think that's a, that's a reasonable assumption. Let me quickly go back to the chat. Anyone asking questions? Da, 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 da. Uh... Yeah, so our question is Dlib free? Yes, it is. Um, and it has a license that allows commercial use. Uh, so that's really cool. All right, so back to the code. So now I have landmark points in uh, real time. I've got my 68 landmark points. So um, the first thing I do is check for I state. So I've got this neat little method here called R eyes open. 
our eyes open. And so you can see it receives this class with the 68 landmark points. And I can, I can basically get at any point with this bit of code. So there's this method called get part. And um, I ask for a specific landmark point. I call get part, provided the number, the index number of the landmark point. And what I get back is, um, you can see it's a point structure. So it's, it's a point structure and that just gives me X and Y coordinates. So what I'm doing here is I am running through the landmark points of the left eye and the right eye. And I'm basically just taking these DLib landmark points and I'm converting them to OpenCV sharp points. So I'm using another library called OpenCV um, for, because it's really good at image manipulation. Uh, transforming, rotating images, calculating with images. And the, uh, the code that I use also for head tracking uses OpenCV. So I basically, I start out mapping everything to OpenCV point structures. So it's a bit silly because it's the same structure. Both structures have, uh, they're both called points. They both have X and Y members, but the one is defined in DLib and the other one is defined in OpenCV Sharp and they're not compatible. So I basically have to copy the numbers from the one to the other. It's a bit silly, but it's unavoidable. So I've got my two eyes. And then what I do, I use this really neat, uh, this, this neat function here called fill convex poly. So this is an OpenCV um, uh, method, an OpenCV method. And what it does, I provide it with a path, a series of coordinates, and it will draw a closed line through those coordinates, fill that area with pixels and give me back the number of pixels. So, um, so what I do is I create these two areas with fill convex poly, and then I use this function here, count non-zero, and it's just gonna count the number of pixels. So this gives me the number of pixels in my, le my visible left eye surface and my visible right eye surface combined. So those two together. So this is, um, if I go back to the, um, to the slides, so this is the, see that blue area? the detected eye surface area. So it's basically that surface area for both eyes together. So then what I need to do is I need to go through this formula. So you can see that the state of the eye is the detected surface area divided by 0 0.4 times pi times r squared. So here I'm basically running that formula. So I am um, calculating the state of my eyes, so here you can see the 0 0.4 showing up. So I'm calculating the, the state of my eyes, um, basically on a scale from zero to one. And um, let's see, calculating down. So you can see, I, I even put a little fudge factor in here, minus 20 to, uh, because when I closed my eyes, there were still enough pixels visible that the software was thinking that my eyes were still open. So I subtract, to, uh, I normalize this to a, a scale between zero and 100, and then I subtract 20, so that when I close my eyes, it actually drops to zero. And then here, th here's how I detect eye states. So basically, this is a number between um, zero and 100, and if the number is higher than 30, then the eyes are open. And if it's lower than 30, then my eyes are closed. So this is how I detect eye state in real time. So this, this, this method just returns a Boolean. False means eyes are closed. True means eyes are open. Um, and here's the head rotation, the head tracking code. So I've got this method called is driver facing forward. It uh, receives a, um, a matrix containing three head rotation angles, right? Um, so here, um, these angles are in, radi uh, in radians, so I need to convert them to degrees. So I do that here in this code. So it gives me three angles, left, right, up, down, and rotation. So rotation is like this. So this is like a, a z-axis rotation, basically, for, uh, for head tracking. So I get three angles. And then basically looking directly forward means that the left right angle is between minus 25 and plus 25 with zero being straight ahead. And the up down angle is between minus 10 and plus 10 with zero straight ahead. So minus 10, plus 10, minus 25, plus 25. And again, I get back a Boolean. So Boolean true means the driver is looking straight ahead 
Boolean false means um, horizontal angle is outside of this 25 degree area or the vertical rotation is outside of that 10 degree area. And that's basically, that's the important part of the code. Uh, now, if I scroll down, there's one more thing I can show you. That's this thing here. So this is the event handler that receives a video frame. So every, uh, when the camera starts, um, every, every time when there's a frame available, this um, method will be called. And um, you can see I, I grab the frame here. And then I call detect landmarks. So that gives me the landmark points. And then, scrolling down, I draw the landmark points in the box at the bottom right. So this shows the, uh, you know, basically all the landmark points to, um, it shows how my face is moving, how my face, my head is rotating. Um, it draws the eyes in the bottom left box. And then it calls some funky math, uh, math code in the background. So I put this code in the utility class. So if you're interested in looking how that works, um, the first thing I need to do is calibrate my camera. Now, of course, I'm using a, the webcam in my Mac, which is not calibrated. So this method here, get camera matrix, it's, it returns a kind of a fudged calibration matrix that kind of works well in generic scenarios. Of course, in a self-driving car, you would literally calibrate your camera and use the exact hardware specs of your camera. Here, I'm just making an educated guess. And then I'm calling this detect head angle. So I'm throwing the landmark points in, I'm adding the camera matrix, and then I get three outputs. I get a rotation matrix, a translation matrix, and a bunch of coefficients. And then when I combine the rotation and the translation matrix, um, this happens here, I get the three head rotation angles. So I get the X, Y, and Z head rotation in uh, radians. And then I can call this method, you know, that calculates the head uh, rotation. So there's one extra call here, draw pose line that draws that little line that emanates from my nose. So it will draw it in the bottom right box. It's a line that sticks out from my nose. So when I turn my head, you can see that line move like that. So it's easier to track the, um, the orientation of my head. Now scrolling all the way down, there's one more thing in here and that is a timer. So I'm running a timer in the background, which uh, basically on a separate thread, it ticks every few milliseconds. And so the only thing the timer does is it's grabbing this head rotation uh, matrix that I just calculated and passes it to is driver facing forward, gives me a Boolean. And it does the eye check. So it passes the landmark points into the are eyes open method. That gives me another Boolean. And then it flips the label based on those two labels. So the driver has to be facing forward and his or her eyes have to be open for the label to be visible. So I'm basically flicking that label on and off on a separate timer thread. Um, so what do you think? So put in the comments, put in the Facebook Live or in the uh, Zoom chat, what you think of the code so far. It's pretty simple, eh? 277 lines of code for the uh, main form. And then of course I put some stuff in the utility class, but if I scroll down, you can see it's, uh, where are we? Here, 246. So 246 and 277. So that's slightly over 500 lines of code. That's not bad. And that includes um, user interface overhead. So I think that's quite good. Okay, so RTI Bob, you say it looks simple. Yup, it is. Uh, Dragos, it's clear. Pretty awesome, right? Um, let me look at the Facebook Live. Um, so Eugene, you're asking, will built-in cameras do the trick? So yeah, you can use built-in cameras. Um, you, you saw that in my code, I had to estimate the camera calibration matrix, um, but um, I'll run the code in a sec and you can see you get fairly good results. Um, if you really want an industrial solution, then you would uh, calibrate your camera professionally and you would use a professional camera. But here, what I'm using is just the built-in webcam, uh, the camera built into my MacBook Pro, and it works fine. Um, Alan, you're asking, are always the same initial points for eyes in X and Y? How can we map for most faces? Well, the landmark points are always the same. So points uh, 36 to 41, that's always the left eye. But where they appear in the camera frame is completely random. Um, I mean, that, that's different every time. So you, do you have to do a bunch of math 
to, um, to, to translate those landmark point coordinates to um, you know, eyes being open or closed or head rotation or whatever. So where these coordinates appear, of course you don't know, that's, that's always different. Um, Eli, you say it's incredible. Using simple codes, how amazing. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Uh, Eugene, that is cool. Hairi, really cool. I have a question. Is it possible to calculate speed of vehicle with this? Speed of vehicle. You'd have to point the camera forward so that the car is filming the road, but you can definitely do it. I mean, um, the camera would be filming traffic signs, um, utility poles flashing by, you know, like that. You could easily uh, correlate that to vehicle speed. Yep, absolutely. But it's probably easier to just use GPS for that. I mean, it's probably not uh, a, a, you know, you wouldn't be using uh, computer vision for that, but you could do it in theory. Okay, Sunil, question in Zoom. DLIP, is DLIP actually doing the face detection? Yes. Is it using machine learning for the same? Yes. So the face detector and the landmark detector in DLIP are neural networks and they are pre-trained. Um, so they are pre-trained on like millions and millions of faces and um, they, DLIP provides the training file. Uh, so it's basically the weights of the neural network after training. So it's this data file, it's about 50 megabytes and you load it uh, to initialize the uh, landmark detector. And then from then, on, from then on, it will accurately pinpoint the landmarks. So it's a pre-trained neural network. Um, all right, want to see the code run? Ah, another question. Johnny, what is the advantage of using C-sharp comparable with using ml5.js? ML5, okay, so I'm not familiar with ml5.js, but um, keep in mind that um, industry standard computer vision applications are almost always programmed in C or C++. Um, you could theoretically do it in C-sharp, but uh, most of the computer vision research goes into C or C++. Um, so you will always need to call into a, uh, a native library to do the uh, face detection and the landmark detection. So I would say the advantage of using this code, using C-sharp, is that it's easier to call into a C++ library. Um, because uh, ML5.js, that looks like a JavaScript library, it will definitely work, but it's going to be slower. Uh, I mean, JavaScript is super fast, but you're going to have to make native calls from JavaScript into C++. And to me, that sounds a bit messy. Plus, if you're selling this to a company, it'll be easier to sell um, compiled code. Um, it's easier to sell a C++ library, C-sharp compiled application than a JavaScript solution, especially if performance is key, eh? if you want like maximum performance. Um, Eri, question, Could it, is it possible to use this face recognition to detect animals' faces? Uh, yes, you'd have to retrain the, the neural networks to uh, recognize animals, but then you could detect the animals with the, I guess you would call it the frontal animal detector, right? <laughs> so you would detect the rectangle, and then you could use the shape detector to find the landmark points of the animal face. And it would be the exact same thing. So you could track the eyes, the eyebrows, the snout, the mouth, um, you know, all the features of an animal's face in real time. You can definitely do, definitely do that. So I'm not sure if it's useful to track if a dog is paying attention to the road while driving a Chrysler car in super cruise mode. <laughs> but you could definitely do it. I mean, you could definitely write that software. Uh, it would work on dogs, absolutely. But I'm sure there's more useful stuff you can do with uh, animal facial landmark detection. All right, I'm gonna run the code. Check this out. Um, yeah, it's all ready. So uh, final thing, I'll show you the packages. So these are the packages I'm using. So I'm using this, this library called Accord. And basically I'm only using it for the video player. So Accord has this really nice video player that you can hook up to the camera and it will just start playing the live video feed. And it, it, it has this event handler um, that you can connect to and then you get the, the bitmaps for every, for every camera frame. So I like that. Accord also has lots of cool image processing um, uh, functions, image processing uh, code. So Accord is my favorite uh, library for computer vision. And get this, it's completely written in C-sharp. So Accord, there's no C++ or C anywhere. Accord is all C-sharp. 
So I always start with Accords. Um, unfortunately, Accords cannot do reliable face detection and landmark detection. It just cannot do that. Um, so for those two parts, I use DLIP. And one other thing that Accord cannot do, it cannot calculate the surface area of my eye and calculate the number of pixels, count the number of pixels. You saw that code, yeah, those, those lines of code. Um, it's not in Accord. So I'm importing this OpenCV Sharp package. So the OpenCV is another famous, famous computer vision library. Um, I'm importing it just for those two methods, for calculating this area and for counting the pixels. So those are my packages. So you can pull these from NuGet, uh, no problem whatsoever. Um, okay, I'm gonna run this code, here we go. Compiling, running. It's slightly slower now because I'm, I'm doing this live webinar. So it's slowing down my computer a little. Okay, let's wait. So now it's initializing the neural networks. Here we go, here's the UI. I'm gonna move it in front of my camera. So, um, you, so you, can, you can see my face in the uh, top right. So that's, um, uh, that's me, live. And um, you see the head pose detection at the bottom left, sorry, the bottom right, and the eye state detection in the bottom left. So the, the code is slightly less um, accurate uh, because I'm running this Zoom webinar at the same time. Uh, so if you run this um, standalone on your computer, you'll get better performance. So let me move a bit closer. So you can see the head tracking at the bottom left. Let me slowly turn my head. So yeah, it's not bad, right? Straight ahead again. I'm gonna look up. And down. Um, So that works. Now eye state detection. Eyes closed, eyes open. And uh, like that. So even that works. So I'm, I'm driving my Chrysler, you know, so I'm driving and it's like, oh, I, I spilled my Coke, hold on. And then, uh, the autopilot will disengage. Or, you know, I'm talking to the person next to me like that. So you can see there's a bit of noise. The label flicks on and off. Um, normally what you would use is some kind of uh, dampening algorithm to uh, calculate the eye state and head rotation over multiple timeframes and then dampen the effects a bit so that the, car, the software gets more accurate. I didn't do that. So you're looking at the raw detection uh, going on right now. And um, let me also crank up, no, the, this, the contrast is as high as it will go. Eyes closed, eyes open, moving away. Because it's reasonably independent from how far away I am. If I get too close, then the head tracking gets a bit uh, confused. And you can see I'm, I'm fairly close to the camera right now. And now I move far away. And then see here, this would be about the limit. So you can see there's, there's quite a range where it's, it's still working. So um, in a car, it would be something like this. You know, you would want the camera on the steering wheel to have a good view of my head. Um, so I'm looking straight ahead like this. See, this works. Bam, and the autopilot off. Autopilot back on. Autopilot off again. Eyes closed. Autopilot off. Eyes open. Autopilot on again. 
So what I would do is um, something like, as soon as the software detects that the um, that I'm not looking forward or that my eyes are uh, closed, um, it would start some kind of timer. You know, you could do something like a reset timer, where um, you you track this for three or four seconds. And then as soon as the software is confident that my attention is on the road again, it would stop the timer. So uh, multiple trigger events in a four or five second window would cause the autopilot to completely disengage, something like that. So um, by daylight, it's, it's night now in uh, where I am. So by daylight, this is gonna work better. So you can see this is why the Chrysler has infrared lights illuminating the face. The more light, the better. Um, if you have enough light, um, then this is gonna be super accurate. And if you're not running a webinar at the same time, then you're gonna have a really nice frame rate and the software is gonna be very, very slick, very smooth. But you'll find that out when you run the source code yourself. So you don't need anything special. You need a webcam. Um, you, need, um, you need, well, I'm running Windows 10, but this will probably work on older versions of Windows as well. And I'm using Visual Studio Community Edition 2017. So uh, it's fairly simple. So let me stop that. And da, 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 da. so my windows get so slow when I'm running a zoom. <laughs> it's really terrible. All right, back to the back to the chat. So let me quickly check. Did you guys post any questions in the meantime? Um, can we make it to remember a face, Mohammed? You're asking. Um, if you want to do face recognition, that's a whole different ball game. Then you would train a neural network to um, recognize different people. That's a form of unsupervised learning. So you can do it, but it's, it's a different example. Alan, you said, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Johnny, that's cool. Thanks for your instructions. Um, Eugene, Mark, can you test if it can do eye rolling only, no head movements? Of course, you can disable the, um, the, the uh, head tracking part and only do eye state detection. That will definitely work. Um, any other questions, guys? It's pretty cool, huh? 500 lines of c -sharp code, live head tracking, live eye state detection, just runs super smooth. Okay, so let me wrap this up with a few uh, little things. Um, ah, question from Sunil, our application didn't use machine learning techniques for eye state management. Correct. Um, this was a straight, up, a, a straight up algorithm for eye state detection. What you could do is take the landmark coordinates of the eyes, take those coordinates and just feed them into a, um, a deep neural network, a feed forward neural network with two or three layers, and then let the neural network figure out when eyes are closed or eyes are open. That would give you much more accurate tracking. Here I'm using a bit of math and I'm, you know, I'm basically making some estimates. It kind of works, sort of. A neural network will get you much better accuracy. So a deep neural network it will definitely help here. Um, Eugene, you say, thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate the effort you put in. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so let me quickly show you this. Um, so, what you've seen so far is computer vision with a bit of machine learning thrown in. Yeah, the shape detector uses machine learning, uses a neural network. I am a uh, machine learning uh, .NET developer. And um, I, I do this, I, 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 I train people in machine learning because machine learning, I call that a blue ocean niche. So uh, when, you look at, um, when you look at IT, when you look at the field of IT, of development, um, the competition has really heated up. Eh? I mean, there's loads of competition, um, there's globalizations, so we're, we're competing with people all over the world. So you have to be really careful what you specialize in. If you are a mobile developer, a mobile app developer, five years ago, that was fantastic. Seven years ago, that was like the best possible specialization, specialization you could have because everybody would come to you and ask you to build apps. Nowadays, there are so many mobile developers that it's hard to find a job. Database developer. Data, I was a database developer in 2005. That was amazing. That was like the, the most fantastic consultancy gig you can imagine. I just went from company to company fixing SQL Server databases, which nine times out of 10 is just re-indexing their tables. That was it, you know, done. 
and a fantastic job. There were almost no SQL Server specialists on the market. So it was fantastic. And then, of course, everybody had a database. Everybody started specializing in databases and it was no longer special. So machine learning now is a blue ocean niche, which means that it's a market, it's a job market with high demand and low supply. High demand and low supply. And that means that um, if you specialize in machine learning, and you have to do that right now, then people are going to ask you for, uh, for work. People will offer you work. I mean, um, you, you don't have to look for jobs anymore. People will come to you. Um, because there are so few machine learning specialists on the market right now, and all the companies are desperate for good people, especially if you can combine machine learning with C-sharp, Think of all the companies out there that have .NET infrastructure, that have .NET software, .NET enterprise applications. They all want machine learning. Imagine, imagine if you are the person who could do that. You can provide them with a, a machine learning, with a deep learning component that you can just drop into their existing infrastructure. I mean, that's, that's, that's a meal ticket. That's a really awesome job. <clears throat> so I always say that machine learning is a blue ocean niche because it's, it's a job market with low competition, high security and high wages. So you won't get fired, your job won't get offsourced, you won't get outsourced, um, your wages will be high because it, it, it's, um, it's a seller's market, right? So companies will have to offer good wages for you to come to them. So you'll have high wages and you'll have awesome job security with very little competition. So it's, it's, it's a perfect time right now to get into machine learning. And uh, Microsoft is really working hard on creating a machine learning environment in .NET, in C Sharp. So it's all, it's all Python right now, but every week we get a little bit more of C Sharp. So in a couple of months, um, C Sharp .NET will be a viable platform to build machine learning applications. So this is a really good time to, uh, to get started. So um, if you want to learn more about that, I've got this website. It's called machinelearningadvantage.com. So just machinelearningadvantage.com. Um, if you just go there and check it out, there's a huge landing page with lots of information about machine learning. I run a course every three months where I train developers to build C-sharp machine learning applications. Um, what you just saw was actually an assignment from that course. So this was in the course, literally. Um, so if you're interested, just check it out. There's a blog with blog posts. There are webinars, free webinars that you can check. I'll also put this webinar on there. And I'll add a link where you can, you can download the source code. So um, all the stuff that I do around machine learning is on that website. So if you're interested, check it out. Okay, that's it. That's the end of this webinar. Um, final chance to ask me some questions. So if you have any questions at this point, put them in the chat and I'll get to them. I'll answer four or five questions and then I suggest we wrap this up. Uh, because I've been talking for one hour and 22 minutes. So again, I haven't succeeded in doing this in one hour. One day I'll manage. Um, Johnny, you have a question. How to deploy this application in Linux-based hardware? Um, that's not easy because unfortunately, the Accord library that I'm using doesn't work on .NET Core. Um, so um, it's, it, what you need to do is look at libraries that have specifically been written for .NET Core. So you can definitely use Dlib, uh, that'll work. OpenCV will also work on, DLib, on uh, .NET Core, um, but Accord is the problem. So you would probably have to use a different video player and change the source code a bit. Um, but I think with about a day's work, you could get it to run on .NET Core, which will mean it will run on Linux because .NET Core, as you well know, it's the multi-platform version of .NET that runs everywhere. Um, so I think that's definitely possible. Uh, Johnny, Windows 10 IoT can run C Sharp, so it can run this kind of application, right? Probably, possibly, yeah. The problem here is going to be the Dlib library, which is written in C++. So you would have to check if Dlib, Dlib will run on IoT, on Windows 10 IoT. If so, then this code is going to run. Yes. Mohammed. You say, thank you, Mark. I am signing up to your website. Ah, go ahead. So you, you can sign up for uh, like a newsletter. And then every time I do a blog post, uh, you, you'll get a notification. I'll send you an email with, uh, with what's in the blog post. So yes, awesome. Thank you for the sign up. Um, any other questions? Did I forget to answer questions? Uh, checking, I'm checking the chat. 
Ah, so Dragos, you got an old question here. What's the best way to learn machine learning? Um, the best way to learn machine learning is, um, the best thing you can do actually is do a Python course. Um, I actually have a Python course, um, Introduction in TensorFlow with Python. Um, but I actually, I, uh, I was inspired by other courses online. If you just do a Google search, there are tons of courses online. They're all Python, everything is Python. Um, you can very, very quickly get up to speed with machine learning that way. If you want to learn, learn machine learning in C-sharp, then there aren't many options right now because it's also new. You can uh, Google it, um, Google ML.net. ML.net is Microsoft's flagship machine learning framework for .NET. And they're pouring all their resources into that framework, into that library. So all the action is happening there right now. Um, if you want to do a course, on C sharp and machine learning, then I think my course is the only one. I don't think there are other C sharp courses on the market yet. I, I really think I'm the first person to, to do this. So you can do my course um, if you like. Um, Dragos, do you think an on site learning method is more efficient than an online one? Well, that's a good question. On site is more efficient. I've done on site teaching, yeah? I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, so I've done classroom. And on-site is definitely more efficient because you're sitting in the classroom, you have the teacher, you know, you can ask questions. It's, it's very physical, it's very in your face. So you, you tend to learn things and retain knowledge better. Um, but unfortunately, it's also hideously expensive. Uh, classroom trainings are really, really, really expensive. And you have to go to the classroom. So you might have to, you might get a long commute. You have to stay in a hotel in a worst case scenario. Uh, so you know, there has to be a, a classroom training in your neighborhood to make it worthwhile. Online trainings, they're getting better and better. Um, in the past, an online training was just text and video. Um, my own course, what I do is I add uh, live videos like this one. So I do like video sessions like this one three times a week. Um, I use a Facebook group for direct one-on-one -on -one training and I do coaching calls. So I basically, I call my students and I, I just talk about their life, their career, uh, how they struggle with the cold, what their plans are, you know, so I, I put a bit of coaching in there as well. And I think that kind of hybrid teaching, so online content and um, live videos, uh, live contact through a Facebook group and, and direct coaching, I think that gets very close to a classroom experience. So I think, uh, I think we can emulate the success of a classroom training online. I think we can do that. And I think we have to because an online training, it doesn't matter where you are, right? You could be in South Korea, you could be in Taiwan, you could be in Chicago, and you can all be together into a single classroom online. So there's no traveling and then we all sit in a room together. If you think about it, it's crazy. It's the 21st century. Why would we get into a car or a plane and then all sit in one room together for a training? You know, it's, I think it's all fashions. So I, I think you can get the, um, the experience. Um, so Dragos, you're saying we could start an on-site academy around the world. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I offer on-site trainings as well, but they are a lot less popular. People tend to go to online nowadays. So I think online is the future actually. Um, anything else? So Alan, you said, thank you. I'm very impressed. I, would, I want to learn more. Um, I'll be there too. Awesome. Very nice. So yeah, for God's sake, guys, learn machine learning. You know, if you're looking for a niche, if you're, if you're a developer right now and um, you want to safeguard your income and you want to safeguard your career and your job, you don't want to be outsourced, you don't want to be offshored, you don't want to be uh, fired because someone else can do your job cheaper. Uh, you really want to secure your income. You want to raise your income. Find a profitable niche. That's all I'm saying. Find a profitable niche. It can be anything. It can be IoT. It can be data warehousing. It can be big data. It can be drones, you know, drone software, anything you like. But find a profitable niche. And all I'm saying is that machine learning right now is a profitable niche. So if you're interested in machine learning, you might as well give it a spin. I mean, why not? I mean, who, who, who doesn't want to double their income, you know? Would you like to double your salary? I mean, why the hell not? Okay, so that's, that's it, basically. Anyone have a final question? Otherwise, I'll end the webinar. Any last words? Anything you'd like to say? 
checking the Zoom chat, all good? All right. Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching. It was awesome having you in this webinar. I'll, I'll be doing webinars every week. So I'll come back next Wednesday at 5 p.m. and I'll do a new one on a different topic. Um, so I uh, hope to see you all again next week. Um, check out my website, read the blog posts, uh, sign up for the newsletter, take a look at the course. Maybe you want to do the course. I mean, it's, my course is awesome. I'm not kidding. I will make you a C-sharp machine learning developer. And I guarantee that six months later, your income is significantly higher than it is now. So if you're interested in that, check out the course. And um, yeah, keep, uh, keep following my, uh, my webinars. And uh, hope to see you again soon.